Reading will be taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Good evening. Brother Jan asked in the announcement or in his announcements this evening, is, did anybody everybody get a nap? I didn't get one. So I'll be doing well if I can make it through the sermon. The rest of you, since you've got a nap, you need to stay awake. And we're glad you're here, especially if you're visiting with us. You're our honored guest. We hope that you'll come back and be with us time and time again. Tonight we're going to be looking at a, a text, a very familiar text from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And of course we will bring other passages to bear upon this, but this passage uh, records the very first sin ever committed. I don't know if you've just ever thought and contemplated that for a moment. There have been a lot of sins committed over the years, but this is a record of the very first sin ever committed. Now just hold your spot here in Genesis and turn with me over to Romans chapter 5, just a second, because Paul makes a point about that in verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And he's referring there to what we read in Genesis chapter 3, the sin of Adam and Eve. And so through one man sin entered the world. That was the first time sin had ever came into this world. Prior to that there was no sin, there was no death, there was no disease. There was no problem. It was a perfect world. And Adam brought sin into the world. And then he says, be careful here, because some of our Calvinist friends, they abuse this verse. He says, and thus death spread to all men, because they inherited from Adam. No, that's not what it says. Death spread to all men because all sin. That's why I die. I die because I sin. I don't die because Adam sinned. I die because I sin. But notice that phrase, because all sin. So sin has spread to everybody. There's a lot of sins that's been committed over the last few thousand years since the creation of the world and since that first sin was committed. But because of that, uh, it, it creates in us a tendency to not take sin very seriously. That's what we really want to talk about tonight. That's the whole point of the lesson. That's the point of the title of the lesson. We sometimes don't take sin seriously. We act like it's no big deal because, after all, everybody sins, and we're just human. And you know, there's a dangerous thing about that statement because it's, it is true. It is true that we are just human. That's fact, folks. There's no way around that. And it is true that everybody sins. Those are true statements. There's just no way around that. But it's a mistake then to say, therefore, because everybody sins, therefore, because everybody has done this, then sin is not such a big deal. That's where we drop the ball. That's where we drop the ball. When we draw that unnecessary conclusion, we think that it's not a big deal because everybody does it. And so we would do well, I think, to go back to that very first sin and think about what it is that makes sin serious business. Because if we, if we can get it in our minds why this is such a serious thing, why my transgression of God's law is such a serious matter, it might help us when temptation comes our way. So first of all, I'd like to suggest to you that sin is defined by God and not man. Turn now back to Genesis. I told you to keep your spot there. If you read with me the first three verses here. It says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, let me just stop and make this comment, this observation. The devil, of course, is being referred to as the serpent. The devil is coming here in, the, in bodily form as a serpent. Uh, he's not literally a serpent, but on this day, he's taken the form of a serpent. Just like Jesus took the form of a human, 
Here, Satan takes the form of a serpent. And so he's more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. If you've got one of those Bibles that puts quotation marks there, you will notice that the, the statement at the end there, You should not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die, is in quotation marks. She's quoting God. And the point I want to make from that is that God defines what sin is. We get in our, we get in our minds, we get to decide what sin is. We get to decide what's right or wrong. I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't, I don't, get, I don't see why that's such a problem. And we've got to understand that when you make a statement like Eve might say or like Adam might say, well, God is just a piece of fruit. That's what they might say when God calls them on the carpet a little bit later. Well, Lord, it's just a little piece of fruit. What's the big deal? We've got to understand that we don't get to decide whether it's a big deal or not. God defines what sin is and how we feel about it really doesn't matter. And whether we see anything wrong with it or not really doesn't matter. God said adultery is a sin, therefore it is, whether I see it or not, whether I like it or not. You see, God defines that. God has said lying is a sin, and so I have no say in the matter. God has said stealing is a sin, I have no say in the matter. God has said gossip is a sin, I have no say in the matter. He defines what sin is. He makes that call, I don't make that call. Right and wrong is determined by God and by His Word. Over in the book of Romans, chapter 7, Paul kind of makes that argument for us here. He's been talking about in the context the relationship of the law of Moses to our salvation. In the earlier verses, he talked about that now we're separated from Moses because that law has died or we have become dead to that law. And so now we can be married to Jesus Christ. We can see that statement in verse 4 in particular. Therefore, brethren, you've become dead to the law, referring to the law of Moses, through the body of Christ that you might be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that you should bear fruit to God. And there's a lot of implications in that verse, by the way. You can't be married to Moses and Christ at the same time. If you try to keep the law of Christ, the law of Moses, you're guilty of spiritual adultery. So you're married to Christ. You're not married to Moses. And you can't be uh, with both of them. You have to be with one or the other. And so we're married to Jesus Christ, you see. But then dropping down to verse 7, he says something very important. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And he's talking specifically here about the law of Moses. Is the law of Moses a sinful thing? Certainly not. Why, that's, that's God's law. It's not a sin. On the contrary, he says, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Do you get what he's saying here? He says God gets to define what sin is. God gets to define what's right and wrong. You would have no idea what's wrong and what's right. You would have no idea what's sin and what's not sin if it wasn't for God. And thankfully, and fortunately for us, he has provided a revelation, a book that we can all read, that we can all understand. In this day and time, we all have access to it. Every one of us probably owns one or more. I own probably 15, 20, or 30 different Bibles, different translations, and probably you do too. And God has made His Word readily available, and He defines sin is wrong because God said it is wrong. And that's all that we need to know. You know, when we were kids, and our parents would ask us to do something we really didn't want to do. We didn't understand why. Why do I have to do that? Why, Dad? Why are you going to make me do that? And you remember what Dad always said. And then, and the reason you remember is because about 25 years later, you start saying the same thing to your kids. You, you, you promise yourself when you grow up, I'll never say this to my kids, but you do. And, and your kids come and you say, well, Dad, why do I have to do that? And you say, because I said so. That's all the reason you need. And the same thing is true with God. Well, God, why is fornication a sin? Because I said so. God, why is lying a sin? Because I said so. And on and on it goes. And so sin is defined by God. That's what makes it such a big deal. He's in charge. I'm not. He gets to tell us what's right and what's wrong, and I don't. I have no say in the matter, nor do you. And that brings us to our next point. How we feel about it is irrelevant. Well, that's hard for us, isn't it? That's hard for us. Because we have feelings about sin. We have feelings about our lifestyle. Over in, back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and this time I want you to look at verse 6. You know, Satan come along the first three verses, and he said, he, he's trying to trick her. He says, has God said you can't eat them? She says, oh yeah, we can eat them all the fruits of the trees except for one. The fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. God has said, 
you should not eat of it, nor shall you touch it. Well, let's, let's drop on down to verse 4. Let's just read 4 through 6. He says, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. He's contradicting God. For God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And Satan's appealing here to her pride. God's trying to keep something from you. He's trying to keep some special knowledge from you. He's trying to keep this, this information from you. And that's why he didn't want you to eat it. And so verse 6, and that's the verse we wanted to bring up for this point. It says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. You know, in verse 6, she's really telling us how she felt. That's what Moses is telling us as he writes it. She looks at that, she says, it says here, that's good, she, that's good for food. Now I know, and I, yes, I'm well aware that the, the forbidden fruit was not necessarily an apple. We don't know what it is. I'm well aware of that, but that's just for an illustration here. That's for illust illustration purposes. But look at that. That might look nice and juicy. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that sure does look good. That looks like a nice, ripe, juicy piece of fruit. It sure looks like it would be awfully tasty. I don't understand why God would tell me not to do that. Listen, how you feel about it is irrelevant. It doesn't really matter how you feel. It might look awful juicy. It might look awful good. It might look awful tasty. But how you feel about it doesn't matter. God doesn't care how you feel about it because he's already said that's wrong. You can't do that. Oh, but we're not done. He says, it was pleasant to the eyes. Isn't that a pretty piece of fruit over there? Oh, that's pretty. And a lot of times people will use those for decorations. They have a fruit basket on the kitchen table. And artists will draw pictures of those and paint pictures of the fruit basket on the table. Or sometimes it's a cornucopia with fruit in it or other kinds of vegetables in it. And they'll draw that or they'll paint that or they'll take pictures of that or they'll actually put a display of that on the table. Sure does look awful good. But I'll tell you how you feel about it. It doesn't matter. Because God's already said it was wrong. And then that third thing. A tree desirable to make one wise. You know, I think the old devil might just be right about this. This is Eve thinking here. I think that devil might be right about this. I think maybe God does, doesn't want me to know good and evil. Maybe God doesn't want me to have that knowledge. Maybe God doesn't want me to be on par with him and know what he knows. And, and, and you know, that's my feelings. That's what happened to Maybe the old devil's right. Maybe God's wrong. Listen to me. How you feel about it is absolutely irrelevant. It doesn't make one bit of difference how you feel about it. I don't care what the sin is. I don't care what the transgression is. It doesn't make one bit of difference how you feel about it. Now, let's bring that into application in our day and time. Let's talk about the sins of fornication and adultery and homosexuality. People, they say, well, I don't understand why that's wrong. I feel like, I feel like it's just love. What makes the difference if two people have a, have a ring? What difference does that make if they love each other? Why, why can't they live together without the benefit of marriage? If they love each other, why can't they just have a, a night together without the benefit of marriage? As long as they love each other. And, and if I love this woman, what makes the difference whether she's married to somebody else? I love her. I want to be with her. Doesn't, what difference does it make if she's married to somebody else? It's just love. And people today will say the same thing about homosexuality. These two men love each other. They're committed to each other. They're dedicated to each other. They've exchanged rings. How can you say that's wrong? Listen to me. How you feel about it is irrelevant. God doesn't care how you feel. In all honesty, He does not care how you feel about that. You may feel like it's okay to have sexual relations outside the benefit of marriage. It doesn't matter what you feel like. You may feel like it's all right to have that woman or have that man even though they're married to somebody else. But it really doesn't matter how you feel about it. Because God's already spoken. He's already said... You can't do this. And you know, sometimes people will make this even worse. Sometimes they doctor it up and say, well, it's just love. But sometimes they make it even worse and more base and more gross and it's just sex. It's just sex. Well, that's no big deal. It's just, listen to me. How you feel about that is irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. Just as irrelevant as it was when Eve said, isn't that a pretty piece of fruit? Isn't that juicy? Wouldn't that taste awful good to sink my teeth into that? Why, it's just a piece of fruit. What's the big deal? It's the same principle. Exactly, and see, things haven't changed, have they? Ever since the Garden of Eden, things have not changed. People today talk about the use of alcohol and the use of drugs, mind-altering substances that alter our thinking and alter our sense of right and wrong. And they say, well, 
That's just loosening up and having a good time. I used to have a secular job years ago, and, and sometimes we, we would take a, 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 a customer would come, and we'd take them out to lunch. And that's, that's the business people do that. They go, let's have lunch together. Let's talk about this deal or that deal. Or let's talk about what we're going to do for you. And you have lunch together. And here, and, well, let's have a cocktail. Well, it's just, we're just going to loosen up. Let's go and loosen up and have a good time. And, and we kid ourselves because I'm telling you how you feel about your relatives. Let's just, it's just a glass of wine at lunch. What difference does that make? How you feel about that? You may think that's all right. But that doesn't mean it is. See, you don't get to call the shots. And I don't get to call the shots. And then we bring it into the realm of murder, abortion, aborting babies. Why, that's just a mother's right to choose. I feel like... I believe that every woman has the right to control her own body. I believe that every woman should decide whether or not to keep her baby or not. I think every woman should decide whether or not she can abort her baby. You got no business in my womb. You got no business in my bedroom. I'm telling you right now how you feel about that. Your own God could care less. He could care less how you feel about that. You may think it is your right, but I got news for you. It's not your right because it's not your body. God gave you that body. You don't have a right to do what you want with your body. You're bought with a price, the Bible says. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. No, you don't have the right to take a life of a child. In the world. Others will make it more, more, more base and more gross again. It's just an economic decision. I can't afford a baby right now. But you could afford to have sex with that person, could you? You should have thought about that before you had sexual relations with that person. I can't afford a baby right now. Doesn't matter about the economics of it. None of that matters. God could care less. Murder is wrong. Period. And when you learn that, and it goes all the way back to the beginning. You see, those are the same arguments Eve would use. No big deal. It's just a piece of fruit. What's the harm? What's the hurt? And we we make the same arguments. Things have not changed a whole lot. In the book of Galatians, chapter five, verses nineteen through. Paul says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Now just stop there and let that word evident sink in. That means they're obvious. Everybody knows what these are. I shouldn't even have to spell this out is what Paul is saying. I shouldn't even have to tell you this because everybody knows what they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Which means this list is, is by no means complete. Of which I tell you before, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter how you feel about it. Now just go through some of those sins. Let's look at verse 20. Idolatry and sorcery. Those are religious sins. You know, today people say, well, I feel like... As long as a person is religious, what difference does it make what God he worships? What difference does it make what church he attends? What difference does it make how he worships? These are religious sins. Right here, idolatry and sorcery, and then we could add, and such like. There are other religious sins. And, and, and people say, well, I don't see anything wrong. It doesn't matter what you think. How you feel about it is absolutely irrelevant because you don't call the shots. And I don't call the shots. God calls the shots. And we've got to understand that. And you could just go through all those sins and make the same points, make the same arguments. Sin is serious business. But let's notice the third point. People say, well, I'm not hurting anybody. By what I did, I just ate an apple. I just ate a fruit off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I just ate a piece of fruit. What, what, it didn't hurt anybody. It didn't hurt a soul. What's the point? And you, know, you could even say, who could possibly be by a piece of fruit. Unless you throw it at the preacher when he's in the pulpit. That might hurt me, hurt my pride. But who could be possibly be hurt by a piece of fruit? And, and, and when you say it's just a piece of fruit, that's what you're saying. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not hurting anybody. So let's think about how that comes home to us. Well, a little white lie doesn't hurt anybody. It's just a little thing. Take your Bible to the Revelation chapter 21. You know, this, this one verse here would make a good sermon in and of itself. 
of you fellows that, that preach every once in a while might think about this. You could call it the inhabitants of hell. And here they are, right here in one verse. Make a sermon out of one verse. He says in Revelation 21, 8, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and those who tell big whoppers shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And sometimes people, that's the way some people read that. I all that lie God's worried about is the big whoppers. The big lies that'll stand up and walk. The, the bald-faced lies. The little white lies. Everybody does that. Everybody tells little white lies. And, and, and listen, the argument we're making there is that just a piece of fruit. Just a piece of fruit doesn't hurt a soul. Well, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself because God has spoken. God calls the shots and he has said, whether you think it hurts anybody or not, I said it was wrong. And you don't do that. Sometimes people will say, well, a little tax evasion isn't going to hurt anybody. Uncle Sam's got plenty of money and I don't have much. And so I can't hurt anybody if I don't pay all my taxes. If I lie on this line and lie on that line and make myself a little bit bigger refund, I'm not hurting anybody. Uncle Sam ain't never going to miss my $30. Except for one thing. In Romans 13, 7, God says, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. And I can hear it right now. What I don't like what they're doing with my tax money. You know what? I don't need it. But I, I, I'm reminded of the fact that at this time when Paul wrote these words, these people lived under the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire would take their tax money and build temples to their false gods. And yet Paul says, pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Well, I'm not hurting anybody. I, I'm just trying to help myself. I'm not hurting anybody else. God said, pay your taxes. And you see how it goes. And it's the same argument that he could make. Well, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just peace free. Not hurting the soul. Here's another one. Well, a little pornography isn't going to hurt anybody. A little pornography is going You know, there was a day when it was a little bit more difficult. Not, not a lot more, but a little bit more difficult to get it. Somebody would find out. Because you'd have to actually walk up to a counter at a store. Or you'd have to send somebody covertly to get it. But that person you sent covertly to get it knows good well he's going to bring it back to you. So there was a time when you could get it, but people knew it would get out. But now, click, click, click with your little internet, click with your little computer, click here, click there, click here. Why? That's no big deal. I'm not hurting anybody. I haven't committed adultery against my wife. I haven't hurt my neighbor. I haven't stolen anything. I'm just clicking on looking at pictures. That's all I'm doing. And you're making the argument, well, it doesn't hurt anybody. Except for one thing. God said it's a no-no. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 28. And I believe this principle... Just like this morning, we were talking about the principle of modest dress, and he talked about women, but I said that, that cuts both ways for women and men. I think this principle cuts both ways, too, for women and men. This one's addressed to the men. And he says, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I think that cuts both ways. Women can go clicking on the Internet, too. And women can go clicking and looking at men. And sometimes, in this day and time, they might be looking at other women. You never know nowadays. To be clicking and looking at this and clicking and looking at that and taking off. Well, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not hurting anybody. Yes, you are. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. You're diminishing the person that you need to be. God has put a high bar. I want you up here. I want you up here. I want you to live like this. And every time you click on that, you're diminishing yourself. You're making yourself less of a man. You're making yourself less of a woman making yourself less of a Christian. You're making yourself less in the eyes of God. And this is, this is all bad. I mean, you know this is all going down here. That bit of going down here, down, down, down. Ultimately, you're going to go right down into the flames of hell. Because you keep diminishing yourself. Every time you click, 
every time you look at a page, every time you open a book, and you're looking at it. Well, I'm not hurting anybody. Yes, you're hurting yourself because you don't get to make that call. God makes the call, and he has said it's wrong. Well, let's see if we can bring this around to a, to a little bit more positive note here. If God defines sin, and I think this is very important, then only he can forgive it. That's another hard lesson to learn. We think we get a right to plan our own way of salvation. Paul wrote to the Romans, he talked about that, uh, that seeking to establish their own righteousness, he said. They've not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. That's in Romans 10. So people sometimes think, I can find my own way back to God. But that's not the way this works. The cost of forgiveness is high. We preach many sermons on that. The cost of forgiveness is high. And I can't help but I always go back to that little parable in Matthew 18. Remember that man that owed the 10,000 talents? And he said, have patience with me and I will pay you all. In Matthew 18, 27, it says, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But it cost that. It cost that king, didn't it? It cost him 10,000 talents. You see, he already paid that out. I, I, I loaned you 10,000 talents and you're not able to pay me back. And never mind. The cost of forgiveness is high. When you forgive somebody, it costs you. It hurts. It hurts you right down to your core. It costs God his own life. You see, Jesus said, I'll bear the cost. I'll die in your place. I'll die in your place. But I can put some conditions on that. I'm not going to just wipe it out just because I can. I'm not going to just wipe it out just to wipe it out. I'm going to put some conditions on it. And if God's going to forgive me, he gets to, he gets to make that call for just like I can't make the call about what's right and wrong, I can't make the call about how to get back into the good graces of God. He makes that call. Over in the book of Luke, chapter 13. And verse 3. In fact, let's just back up to the beginning here for some context. Verse 1. There was a tragedy that had occurred in their day and time. It would have made the headlines had they had newspapers that day it says there were present verse 1 at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices it's a big massacre and people had done something that Pilate didn't like and he killed them so their blood was mingled with their sacrifices Jesus answered and said do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things this was a terrible tragedy do you think they were worse sinners because of it he said I tell you no but unless you repent you will all likewise perish a lot of lessons there. One, sin is sin. Two, it's going to reduce the result in the same thing for all of us. We're all going to perish. Three, forgiveness is conditional. Unless you repent. Unless you repent. Listen, I sent, God said that to us, I sent my son to die on the cross. He paid the price for your freedom. He paid the price for your forgiveness. But you've got some skin in the game. If you want that forgiveness, you're going to have to you're going to have to do some changes. You cannot continue to live in sin. And so forgiveness can be conditional, and God gets to make that call. I don't get to make the call. I say, well, I think so-and-so ought to go to heaven. I think so-and-so ought to make it. That's not your call. That's God's call. He decides who's going to be saved and on what basis. Move on out to Luke 17. Here he talks about human forgiveness. And even here he says it's conditional. Keep in mind, God says it's conditional. In Luke 17, verse 3 and 4, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Did you catch that last phrase? If he repents. Conditional. Forgiveness is conditional. God set those terms. God set those terms. He set it in terms of forgiveness, in terms of your relationship with him, and he set it in terms of our relationship with one another. You want to be right with God? You've got to repent. You want to be right with one another? You've got to repent. God said that, and I don't have any say in the matter. And God requires of us, therefore, if we're going to be forgiven, that we've got to humble ourselves before and turn now to Matthew 18. We'll look at the first few verses here. I think, you know, we look at all the different steps of salvation. And we talk about faith and repentance and confession. And sometimes we think baptism is the hardest step. But, and maybe that's true to some extent. But I think sometimes the hardest step is just humbling ourselves before God. 
That's step number one. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing out of the Lord's mouth, the blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of God. And that's the hardest thing for us to do, is to realize we're not in charge. He is. And we've got to humble ourselves before God. In Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4, at that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child. Now they were probably expecting one of them. Oh, here, Peter, you come here and sit beside me, and I'll, I'll use you as an example. Or, or here, Judas, you come up here and sit beside me, and I'll use you. But he did. He, he goes here and picks up a child, and he brings him over. And he says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not talking about the meanness that little kids do sometimes. He's talking about humility. And children are like that. Children are humble. And the reason they're humble is because they're dependent. I depend on Daddy for all my good blessings. And so I humble myself before Daddy. And the same thing is true with our Heavenly Father. We depend upon Him for all of our blessings. And we must humble ourselves before Him. God can forgive it, but God has to set the terms. Just like God tells us what sin is, and I don't get to make that call. God tells us what forgiveness is, and I don't get to make that call. He makes that call. These are tough lessons for people to come to grips with. But what I want you to see is, it's always been that way. It's been that way since the very beginning. And man has struggled with this, and struggled with this, and struggled with this. Now, when you think about humility, let me use this illustration. I read this somewhere the other day, and I thought it was very good. There was the angry father who made his child sit in the corner for some disobedience. And the child's sitting over there, and his eyes full of tears. And he looks up at his daddy, and he says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. You know, that's what we do to God sometimes. God, I may be bowing on the outside. I may come to services, and I may go through the motions. I may be bowing on the outside. But inside, I'm standing up, and I'm insolent, and I'm prideful, and I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. That's not going to work. That's just not going to work. Jesus says we've got to humble ourselves. The bottom line in all of this is we've got to understand that sin is very serious business. You may not see anything wrong with it. You may feel like it's no big deal. You may think it doesn't hurt anybody. But sin is a violation of the will of a holy God. You see, we have no, we can just barely grasp the concept of an absolutely holy and pure God. Someone who the, the thought of sin in his mind is repulsive. Even the very thought of it is repulsive. He is so absolutely pure and so absolutely holy, that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But because that's who he is, he despises sin. And when he tells us this should not be done, believe me, this should not be done. It is serious business. Sin either has to be punished or forgiven. That's the bottom line. It has to be punished or forgiven. There's a judgment day coming. And there's going to be two groups of people. The people who are going to be punished and the people who've been forgiven. The question is, which group are you going to be in? It's your call. It's your call. You see, in all this, we have free will. And we can make the call. I'm going to be in the group that's going to be punished because I may bow on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. So you're going to be in the group that's going to be punished. Or you might be over here in the other group that says, I will humble myself before God. I will acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I will repent of my sins. I will be baptized. I will serve him all the days of my life. That's the choice I wish for. I wish you'd make the right choice. If we can help you tonight, to obey the gospel. Won't you come right now while we stand and while we stand?